So my name is Avneet Sodhi. Uh, yes, I'm an ophthalmologist, not a cardiologist. Yes, I'm in the right place. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, asked to present something different, an ophthalmology case. Um, I'm actually presenting on behalf of my brother, Ganit Sodhi. He's a fourth year chief resident ophthalmology at Eastern Virginia Medical Center um, in Norfolk, Virginia. I've been practicing for about six years, um, director of the glaucoma services, as well as the LASIK and cataract surgeon at a CLI Institute in Beverly Hills. I just advance here. So I'm gonna present a case of a 33-year-old Caucasian female. She came in with, uh, presenting with a dark diagonal bar across the superior nasal portion of her right visual field. Her past medical history is insignificant, no medications on presentation, her social history, she denied any smoking, occasional alcohol use, and no illicit, illicit drug use. Her family history, she had a father with hypertension, well controlled, and a single paternal uncle with some clotting disease. Um, so abbreviated eye exam, her vision in her right eye was 2040, which is three lines um, uh, above the 2020 line. Her left eye was 2020. Her pupil exam was completely normal, no afferent pupillary defects. On confrontational visual field, she had a supranasal defect in her right eye. So I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm assuming not a lot of people look at retina exams here. Um, if you do, I'm very impressed. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna just backtrack what a normal retina exam should look like. So this is a retina exam of the right eye. How do I tell it's a right eye? The optic nerve, when you're looking at the photo, will be on the right side. The optic nerve always lies on the nasal portion of the retina. There will be vessels um, arcading off um, in an arcade fashion, superiorly and inferiorly, predominantly in the temporal region. Can I use a pointer here? That's okay, I'll just describe. Um, and then the macula is the avascular region, um, as well as the fovea that's used for your central vision. The arteries are typically smaller than the veins, and about the width is about two to three ratio. So this is the patient's right eye on presentation. As you can tell, that is the right eye. The optic nerve is on the right side. It's a clear view to the back. The optic nerve, a little bit small here, but it is pallor. Um, there is some hyperemia on the superior aspect of the optic nerve. The vessels look tortuous compared to the last photo that you saw. And then pretty prominent, you could see that there is inferior um, whitening along the inferior arcade. And I don't know if you can see it here, but super nasally towards the disc, there's some um, retinal hemorrhages as well. F feel free to walk up. I'm gonna, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So we also use fluorescein angiography quite a lot in ophthalmology. It helps us to distinguish if there is hyperperfusion, low perfusion throughout the eye, if there is hemorrhages, swelling, edema, so on and so forth, also distinguishes vasculitis as well. So this is uh, the fluorescein angiogram of the right eye of the patient. This is what we call an early transient phase because the arteries are already filled, the venules are in their laminar phase, so the venules are starting to fill right now. Um, so as you can see, inferiorly, there is hyperperfusion in the inferior arcade, and then it actually stretches up to where the macula is. And then where there was hemorrhages, you can see there's more hemorrhages along the retina as well. We call those blocking defects in the fluorescein angiogram. So what is the diagnosis? Any takers? No. So the differential diagnosis in this case, retinal vein occlusion, diabetic retinopathy, retinal artery occlusions, hypertensive retinopathy, and retinal vasculitis. So the diagnosis is a retinal artery occlusion, specifically a branch retinal artery occlusion because it's only uh, involving one segment of the arteries. So I'm gonna go in why, just kind of um, refreshing on what 
we see in ophthalmology because clinical diagnosis in ophthalmology is key to clinching um, what is going on with the patient. So in hypertensive retinopathy, you will find that there is a lot of hemorrhages. Um, uh, the vessels are tortuous. That's in mild and moderate patients. In this patient up on the panel up there, that's actually a person who has hypertension urgency or emergency. So they have multiple cotton wool spots, dot blot hemorrhages, and you see that stellate pattern up there. Can't really tell on the photo, but they have, have, they have macular edema, and the, the stellate pattern there is actually exudate, lipid exudate, that is resolving macular edema. Branch retinal vein occlusions, uh, the classic thing, you'll see a brush fire appearance. So it's flame hemorrhages along the arcades. If it's a central retinal vein occlusion, you'll see it all throughout the retina. Retinal vasculitis is a blanket term for a lot of infectious and um, uh, immune, autoimmune etiologies that could cause it, like sarcoidosis, bichettes, so on and so forth. Retinal vasculitis has this periarterial sheathing. That's because it's accumulation of inflammatory cells around the blood vessels. Um, in sarcoidosis patients, it actually has more of like a candle wax dripping effect uh, on the arteries. And then diabetic retinopathy, you'll have dot blood hemorrhages and exudates macular edema as well. All of these are bilateral um, entities except for the arterial occlusions and the branch retinal vein occlusions are usually unilateral. So what's next? Anyone with a retinal artery occlusion, it's considered an ophthalmic emergency. It's, an, it's equivalent to a cerebral stroke. Per the American Heart Association guidelines, they should be evaluated immediately with a stroke workup. And if age appropriate, they need to be evaluated for giant cell arteritis as well. In patients who are less than 50 years old, they, you have to think outside of the box. So you wanna do a hypercoagulability workup. Also a really good review of systems. You wanna ask about drug use any migraines, um, also sensory hearing loss or mental status changes as well. So this patient was admitted into the internal medicine um, uh, for um, a stroke workup and also with neurology consult. So they were started on aspirin. Uh, they had a negative bilateral lower extremity PVL. Uh, they had normal carotid and vertebral duplex. Their echo actually showed a atrial septal aneurysm with a patent for foramen ovale with a positive bubble study. So on, they had extensive laboratory workup. What was um, pretty prominent was that they had a protein C um, activity and antigen deficiency. So the diagnosis in this patient was cryptogenic branch retinal artery occlusion in the setting of protein C deficiency in a patient with a PFO. So in the clinical course, she was started on aspirin and also Zorato. She was recommended to get, uh, the family was recommended to get a genetic testing. Three weeks later, she presented for heavy menstrual bleeding with symptomatic anemia. Uh, OBGYN thought it was not due to the Zorato, so they started them on Provera and stabilize, the patient stabilized. Uh, cardiology performed a closure of the PFO. So I just kind of wanted to go briefly what the branch retinal artery occlusions. They typically are 50% of our, all artery occlusions. They are typically embolic. Um, cholesterol uh, embolus are more common. They're called the Hollenhorst plaques. Um, fibrin, calcium, fat, talc, you can also have um, retrobulbar anesthesia as well as fillers like Juvederm has shown to have uh, caused retinal um, artery occlusions as well. And in about 62% of patients, you will actually find the embolus. Um, in the others, you will not. So a lack of embolus doesn't mean that there is no artery occlusion from the embolus. Non-embolic causes are coagulopathies, migraines, cocaine, and inflammatory infectious causes are toxoplasmosis, zoster, Lyme disease, giant cell arteritis, syphilis, sarcoid, and TB. SUSAC syndrome is actually a very rare syndrome um, and very debilitating. It's a bilateral, multiple branch retinal artery occlusions. 
uh, patient also presents with encephalopathy and hearing loss as well. So what's really unique about this patient um, for ophthalmology in particular, this is actually a very rare case report, um, uh, especially with a patient of protein C deficiency and branch retinal artery occlusions. Um, in all four, th four cases, they were all cryptogenic, so there was no source of embolus found. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very educational. I, I really learned a lot. And last time I looked at pictures like this, we were in med school, so that was a long time ago. But thank you. We are out of time. So if, if there's any questions, we'll probably take one question. If not, I would like to thank everybody. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm just commenting on the gentleman who said, uh, who mentioned something about the indication for renal artery stenosis, this is absolutely class two indication. We can debate, you know, f forever. I mean, if, if you listen to Dr. Chris White uh, and, and some nephrologists, nephrologists uh, don't agree with uh, renal artery stenosis, but qu clearly that patient had class two indication to go for it. The other thing is uh, measuring uh, IFR or FFR. Uh, in, in the private world, in the community hospitals, you will have a, a problem, you might have a problem with the administration because this is not reimbursable. I did it a few years ago and they refused to pay for the 600 or $750 wire. Yeah, so you don't have to uh, use a wire, just the comment was either it's a wire or, or a, a smaller than six French catheter, but yeah, it's fine. I mean, definitely, I think, I think uh, treating patients is very personalized when somebody knows the patient and, examine the patients is very different than somebody sitting here and, and listening to the presentation. So I don't think there was any malintention there, but, but thank you for the comment.